In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So as you heard during the announcements, in uh, two weeks, Bishop Gulick will be here confirming uh, uh, many of us. Uh, and uh, Bishop Gulick and I go way back, uh, actually, since I was uh, early in high school. Uh, one of the great gifts of my ministry is that the vast majority of my ordained life has been in uh, close proximity to, uh, to Bishop Ted, except for a couple years. Uh, and one of the things I've always admired about him is his ability to tell stories and the fact that he has a catalog of stories uh, that fits just about every gospel perfectly. And it has crossed my mind over the years whether he might embellish or shape some of the stories to fit just perfectly because they seem to fit just a little bit too well. Um, but one of the stories that he tells uh, comes to me every time I read this, uh, this gospel. But one of thing that you should never do is actually try to verify the story because once you actually have it in print then you're beholden to the text of exactly what happens and I uh, can't use the 40 years that have transpired between this story uh, to embellish it but it's still a beautiful story uh, you may know this but the the Gulicks I think for 40 plus years uh, have gone to New Hampshire for the summer and um, for parts of the summer and he uh, they live in a rectory that's the that belongs to the church and then in exchange for that um, Ted's either served the church or also been responsible for getting other clergy uh, to come in during those other weeks uh, to cover for the uh, for the church and then uh, the pastoral care of the folks in the in the community as well uh, and it's one of the moments that um, that he looks forward to every year and he recalls a particular summer in 1981 uh, when he was up there in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and there was a panic in the community. A 12-year-old had gone missing in the mountains, in the, in the wilderness, uh, and everyone from towns around, uh, from Whitefield and all the gathering towns, gathered uh, to try to find uh, this 12-year-old boy. And, um, and they searched high and low, day and night, not an hour went by without, uh, without searching, uh, t continuing. Uh, more people came in and they continued to search and their anxiety kept rising the longer uh, it went before they were able to find this child. Uh, and their anxiety obviously uh, was high just because this is a 12 year old boy, uh, but it was exacerbated by the fact that this 12 year old uh, was autistic and might not respond the same way. And what kind of coping mechanisms uh, did this 12 year old have? Uh, what would this 12 year old do? Uh, and um, as uh, day gave way to night and another day gave way to another night, uh, it continued to, uh, to spread the news of the story uh, and concern elevated, anxieties were raised, uh, and, uh, and it was a pretty difficult time for this community. Uh, but the news spread all the way to Boston, and uh, a gentleman was sitting on his couch watching the news, uh, the late news at 10 o'clock that night um, outside Boston, and he saw the story. Uh, he was a firefighter in, uh, in Boston, and he was in one of the suburbs of Boston. He uh, was watching the news, and it struck him so profoundly uh, that within 30 minutes, he told his wife he had to go. He was on the road, and by midnight, he was in the woods uh, looking for this young boy, uh, and he looked through the night. Uh, he got there, started looking, and, uh, and found the boy at 8 in the morning. Uh, and by the time they were talking, uh, the press was talking to this firefighter from outside Boston. Uh, the boy with just a few scratches uh, was in the hospital enjoying ice cream. And they were asking him, how did you uh, find him so quickly? You know, people have been looking for days and they uh, weren't able to find him. How did you, uh, was it because you were a firefighter? Did you have, uh, you know, search and rescue skills that maybe uh, the situation needed? And he said that... Uh, he was struck by the story, not just because he was a father, not just because he was a human being, and this was an incredibly human story. He was struck by the story because he had a boy with autism. And, uh, and that compelled him to action, but it also equipped him. It uniquely equipped him to be able uh, to, to, to be an active part of this rescue. You see, uh, he knew uh, 
that autistic children wouldn't be crying out for help uh, the same way another child would, that especially uh, in, in the anxiety uh, and panic that they would stumble over words and that they would elongate their words and it would come out as, uh, as a more jarbled uh, message and he was listening as he was searching for this boy and he heard uh, an indiscernible sound, but it was a familiar one. And he said, that sounds just like my boy John. Uh, and he followed that sound. And that is how he was able to find this young boy. Um, the love that he had for his son uh, and the way that he knew his son, every hair on his son's head, every uh, m noise that came out of his son's mouth, uh, every plea uh, that his son would make allowed him to be able to find uh, this child, uh, this child uh, who uh, he loved yet didn't even know, uh, and he listened carefully. Uh, I bring this up because I think that the story of the leaving the 99 for the one uh, becomes a numbers story sometimes, but I don't think it's about the numbers at all. I think this is a story about our God, a God that loves us so uniquely, who loved that one not because he needed to return with a hundred, uh, but because he knew everything and loved everything about that one. Uh, even that tendency um, uh, to go and wander uh, by itself, he loved that about that one sheep. He loved every piece of that sheep's life. Every word on every page of every chapter of that sheep's story. That's why it mattered. Not because he had to return with a hundred, but because every one of us, every part of every one of us matters to God. Sometimes when I uh, read the gospel, I look for the rub. But where's the piece that challenges us uh, and compels us to live differently and act differently? Uh, but sometimes the gospel is just about how radical, how reckless, how unabashed God's love is for us. And we're called just to believe it, just to let it wash over us and trust it. And I think that's what this gospel is about. Uh, it starts with the thing that gets Jesus into trouble. And remember, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that probably more than anything else, what led, uh, scholars believe, what led to Jesus being nailed on a cross um, was his dinner company, was the way that he responded to dinner. That makes very little sense, uh, except to think about the fact that uh, the whole model of faith was about keeping things clean. Keep your dinner table clean. Keep out the riffraff. Keep the, uh, the dinner guests uh, to people you know, where you know where they've been, you know their story, you know that they've uh, kept themselves clean, that they follow the law, they prepare themselves, they wash themselves, they keep their nose clean. Uh, and if your table's clean, your children are going to be clean, uh, and everything is going to be okay. And if you're clean, you're holy. And that's the system. And it, I mean, it worked in a lot of ways. Uh, the uh, first century uh, Israel uh, was looked at around the globe for their ability to, to not get sick, uh, you know, to keep themselves clean. It was not just a, a spiritual cleanse, uh, cleanliness, it was uh, in all things. And it worked to a degree, unless you hadn't kept your nose clean, unless you made a couple mistakes. You were part of the uh, infection that you wanted to keep out of the, uh, the body. It worked for the people inside. But it didn't work for Jesus because that's not the way that God loves us. God doesn't love the good majority. God doesn't love the, the clean and not the unclean or uh, loves the whole and whatever uh, protects the whole, that's good enough for God. So uh, Jesus challenges uh, the folks that ask him, why do you dine with riffraff? Why do you eat with them? Don't you know that they're unclean? Don't you know they're going to spoil uh, the stew that a couple rotten uh, vegetables, you have to throw the whole stew out. Uh, don't you realize this? Don't you care about the whole? And Jesus starts telling these parables. And he tells the parable of the sheep. Uh, and we start to think about the shepherd that knows every hair on, uh, on the heads of each sheep. That the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd uh, knows his voice. Uh, and we think about that image of uh, the, the man who understands the autistic boy's uh, pleas for help that come out differently than, uh, than other children. And we realize the uniqueness of God's love for us. And that none of us are expendable. And it's interesting because uh, there's theory and then there's practice. And I think the Pharisees and Sadducees would agree with the theory. 
So Jesus tells this parable about the shepherd and the 99 sheep, and, uh, and the words are important. He says, uh, you know, we, uh, we have 100 sheep, 99 are there, and he realizes one's missing, uh, and he leaves the 99 in the wilderness. He doesn't leave the 99 all well taken care of inside the pen with somebody else to watch him while he goes and looks for the one. He, in the immediacy of the moment, leaves the 99 in the wilderness to go look for the one. And he looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees and said, you do the same, right? And they say, well, maybe in, pra maybe in theory, but in practice, no. No, I wouldn't leave the 99 for the one. What would happen to the 99? You know, I think God knew that they have each other. God knew that the 99 would be able to take care of themselves. But that one who felt alone, who was lost, needed God more than any of them. And it mattered. And then Jesus tells this other parable, this parable uh, where the God figure is a woman. And imagine uh, 2,000 years ago how provocative that is. Uh, and if you've ever lost a set of keys or something uh, important to you, you realize that it consumes your every thought. And it doesn't matter if it's replaceable. Uh, if you've lost it, it twists your mind and body around to look everywhere for it, to retrace your steps, uh, to think about it uh, uh, as you're cooking dinner, as you're uh, uh, doing everything, until you find it, it consumes you. Uh, and I think that God feels that way when we're lost, that it is not indifferent to God, that God uh, uh, can't be bothered with it, and if we make our way back, that's fine, but if not, uh, I think we're to think about it the way that uh, a woman who lost a coin, and it has so little to do with the market value of the coin, with how other people perceive us. That coin was worthless, at least in terms of what it could buy, uh, uh, but it mattered to the woman. And she searched high and low for it, and when she found it, she threw a party that was so infinitely more expensive than the one coin she lost because it isn't about the face value of the coin. And from that, we're supposed to know that it bothers God, that it is of concern to God when we feel lost, uh, when we feel helpless, when we feel hopeless, that our lostness matters desperately to God until we're found. And the rejoicing when we're found is profound. And then these two lead to the parable uh, that's called the gospel within the gospel. And I think we understand it differently. I think we've even titled it differently because we've read it in isolation. The story of the prodigal son which I believe isn't really so much about the prodigal son as it is about the dad. The dad that's just like the shepherd, the dad that's just like the woman in the lost coin. Uh, remember uh, <clears throat> the story of the prodigal, the son has planned out exactly what he's gonna say to the dad. He's, uh, he's got his whole script planned out. When I get back, I'm going to tell him uh, I'm sorry that I shouldn't have done what I did. Uh, I'm going to tell him he can, I can be a slave forever. And then he went through this whole script. He's probably spent the whole trip thinking about, okay, exactly, how am I going to phrase it? And the dad doesn't even give him a chance to make the speech. It's not about his atonement. It's not about him uh, uh, being fixed or right. He only went back because he ran out of money. He isn't loved because he fixed himself and he got himself straight. He's loved because that's always been the father's response to him. And so the dad runs out, embarrassing himself. He runs out. He throws his arm around him. And as the son tries to recapitulate re, uh, 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 his speech again and again, he keeps interrupting him and kissing him and putting a ring on his finger and telling him, you're home. That's all that matters. You're home. So this isn't about us getting our lives all squared away so that God can love us. It's about the fact that God loves us so passionately, so fully, so ridiculously that he's always drawing us home. Not just when we get there, but every step of the way in our incompleteness and in every foible and in every plea for help. God hears and God loves us. And the invitation today is just to trust him. To let it wash over you. And to believe that you are loved like the coin that was found, like the sheep that was worth leaving the 99, like the son that was met with thrown arms around him, that God loves you that passionately. Let it wash over you. Let it hold. Amen.